morning, church. You who are gathered here, you who are gathered online, and it may not be morning when you come and worship with us online, and that's okay, but know that we're holding everyone who is participating in this worship over time, over space. Everyone is, has a place here at First Congregational UCC. We know that we gather in the name of God's love, which is wide and wide and wider still, more than we can even imagine. And so each of us is welcome here, whoever we are and wherever we are on life's journey. So please know that we are here gathered together in community and we also expect the Spirit is already here waiting to show up for you. So I invite you to notice where God is moving. This morning I also want to acknowledge that this has been a hard week for us as a church family. Last weekend two of the folks who have been associated with First Congregational passed away and their funerals were yesterday and so I know some of you were at church all day yesterday um, at funerals and are here again today and we want to acknowledge uh, Virginia Dimmick and Fern Nall. Virginia was a longtime member of First Congregational and Fern was a longtime staff member of First Congregational as office manager. So I'm going to put their little uh, funeral cards up on the altar this morning just to have them present and as we remember them we also remember their loved ones who are going through all kinds of firsts, right? The first Sunday without their loved one, the first worship. So let's keep them in mind and in our hearts and our prayers. And if you weren't able to be at the funeral and you want to come up and see their funeral cards after worship, you're welcome to do that. The peace of Christ is with you all. I invite you to share signs of peace with one another. Let us call ourselves to worship. Our call to worship is divided up a bit differently today. There will be responses for those with high voices and those with low voices. And you get to decide where your voice fits. 
Note that the last response is meant for all voices together. We will not read the scripture references found in the parentheses. In our worship, we listen for what God wants us to do. In our worship, we listen for what God wants us to be. See what kind of love our God has given to us in that we should be called God's children, and that is where we are. Join me in the prayer of invocation. There is not an act of kindness or generosity, not an act of sacrifice done or a word of peace and gentleness spoken that does not sing hymns to you. There is not a flower that opens, not a seed that falls into the ground, and not an ear of wheat that nods in the wind that does not pro preach and proclaim your greatness and mercy, O oh God. Make our being and doing our praise. Amen. to rise in body or spirit. kids that might want to come up and spend a little time with me for children's time. Annie, you want to come up? Clara and Daisy, you want to come up? And you can just sit wherever you want to up here on these steps. Good job. 
Okay. Hi, Annie. So, I have some questions for you. What are some of the things? Annie, you want to sit here? There you go. So, what are some of the things that you do during the day when you wake up in the morning? What are some of the things you do? What? You eat breakfast? Does anybody else eat breakfast? I eat breakfast usually. Do you eat breakfast? Good. And then, um, what do you do with your body? Do you do anything in your body? Yeah. What do you do? You exercise your body. Okay, that's nice. So, so what do you do? You take a bath? Take a bath and a shower. Does anybody brush their teeth? Do you brush your teeth? Yeah, you eat your yummies and you brush your teeth? Okay. And then you exercise. What kind of exercise do you do? Um, run. Run. Can we pretend to run? What is that? Like, like choo, let's run. Your feet run. You at home, if you're right, can you run? Maybe you can run around your house. Okay. And then once we're done running, what else do we do during the day? Anybody go to school? You go to school? Yeah? yeah. And when you're in school, do you go to school or preschool? You stay? You go to daycare. You have crafts. Are there any things like, let's say you come home. Yeah. A play date, you go to the pool. You go to the pool with mom. What do you do? Yes? Okay. And then when you get home, do you have any chores to do at home that help you? Like, like do you have, what, what kind of chores do you have? Yes. Yeah, do you help clean up? You have clean up time at home? You go to the pool, yes. Piano? Swimming lessons? Does anybody have to help make their bed? Do you go to swimming lessons too? You make it, okay. Anybody have to do other chores, like maybe bring your plate from the table into the kitchen? Do you have to do any chores? Yeah, anybody have to take care of a pet? Okay, so then you get to the end of a long day, and you're tired because you've been exercising, you've been doing your chores, you've been swimming, you've had swimming lessons, you've gone to school. What happens at the very end of the day? What do you do? You should go, to go to sleep. Yeah, let's practice that. Let's just, okay, say, we've had a very long day. Can we practice going to sleep? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oof. Anybody else want to practice with me? So, I have a question for you. Do you think you're the people who love you? So, who are some of the people that love you? Like, yeah. My mom and my dad. Your mom and your dad. Your mom and dad. How about grandparents? You have anybody that, yeah. So, do your dog, do you think that when you are sleeping and not doing anything, do you think that they love you less? Yeah? Yeah? Who do you think? They love you whenever you do anything? When you're doing, 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 or when you're sleeping or taking a nap? You're, the people who love you love you all the time? Yeah, you have a mask at home, yeah. And I wonder, I wonder, if we say that God is love, I wonder if God loves us just as much when we're sleeping or taking a nap as God loves us when we're busy doing. Yeah. What do you think? Let's, let's, you can take that question home and you can ask the people that love you and see what you think. And you who are in the congregation, that might be a good question to ask yourself too. I wonder... 
if God loves me as much when I'm napping or sleeping or just hanging out as God loves me when I'm doing and going and being busy. So something to think about. So let's, should we say a little prayer? You want to, should we fold our hands? Do you know how to do that? Oh, look at you. Okay, let's say a prayer where maybe each of us could say something that we are thankful for today. So I'm thankful for you being in church this morning and for me getting to meet you and to see you, Annie, and to see your great recording of your slide. Anybody else have something you're grateful for? Yeah. You have a slide at home. That's something to be grateful for. Yeah, that's something to be, yeah, that makes you happy. Your Oma let you come to church. Yeah. Do you have something that makes you happy? What's that? Oh, that you get to come to church. Okay. And all of your, all of our other words, Livia or Annie, all of your words, that's just a prayer too. So maybe if we say amen, and then the congregation can say amen after us. So we'll be, we'll be the start, and they can be our echo, right? Okay, so on one, two, three. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is from the 18th chapter of Genesis, from the message, a Bible paraphrase. God appeared to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamar while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent. It was the hottest part of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing. He ran from his tent to greet them and bowed before them. He said, Master, if you please stop for a while with your servant, I'll get some water so you can wash your feet. Rest under this tree. I'll get some food to refresh you on your way since your travels have brought you across my path. They said, certainly, go ahead. Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. He said, hurry, get three cups of our best flour, knead it and make bread. Then Abraham ran to the cattle pen and picked out a nice plump calf and gave it to the servant who lost no time in getting it ready. Then he got curds and milk, brought them with the calf that it had been roasted, set the meal before the men and stood there under the tree while they ate. The men said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? He said, in the tent. One of them said, I'm coming back about this time next year. When I arrive, your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent opening just behind the man. Our second reading is from the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke that we hear from the Common English Bible Translation. While Jesus and his disciples were traveling, Jesus entered a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him as a guest. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the feet of Jesus and listened to his message. By contrast, Martha was preoccupied with getting everything ready for their meal. So Martha came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to prepare the table all by myself? Tell her to help me. Jesus answered, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. One thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the better part. It won't be taken away from her. This ends our sacred reading. May God bless its receiving, its understanding, and its living. I found it kind of interesting timing that I had planned on talking about my father's funeral today and then we had two funerals this weekend so maybe there will be something 
about this that might resonate in a different way for you. But first, let us pray. May the words spoken and the words received be only in your service, great God of love. Amen. I want to actually talk about a story that I shared at my dad's funeral. I actually officiated his funeral, which they, my parents had wanted, and I wasn't sure I could do it, but we made it through, and it was really such an honor to do that. But I talked about the fact that I'd had a conversation with him but sometime before he died, in the last year before he died. My dad uh, lived with, suffered from, Lewy body dementia for many years. And um, one of the things about Lewy body dementia is that there can be these random moments of clarity that happen and then just completely disappear. But I happened to be visiting him one time when he had one of these random moments of clarity. And uh, he was talking about feeling bad because he wasn't able to do anything anymore. And something to know about my dad is that he was a doer. Uh, he was a Lutheran pastor, and he uh, pastored back in the days before they talked much about boundaries. And so pretty much he was the church's 24-7, 365, um, and was always giving that way and sometimes didn't, didn't make the boundaries to give enough to family, but he was always doing. And when he was spending time with the family, he was always doing. He hardly ever, like, there was never a butt indent in any chair where he would have sat because he put his shoes on in the morning and he kept going till he put his shoes, took his shoes off to get into the bed. And he was a tinkerer so he could fix anything and he would, he just was always busy. And with his dementia, as he became less and less able to do those things that gave him joy, he, um, he began to feel depressed. And so, in this moment where he was talking to me and I knew that he was able to understand our conversation, I mentioned to him that maybe his spiritual discipline at this point in his life was to learn how to be and to know that his value was still the same, even though he couldn't do all of the things that he used to do, particularly for others. And what it meant to be present and know that God loved him, even though he wasn't busy actively producing anything or busy actively doing on behalf of. And it, he, he was a little startled by that, but he, I could tell he said, yes, yes, maybe I do need to practice that. And then, of course, later, he wouldn't have remembered that conversation, but I know that in those moments of clarity, he took in those things, those feelings, those um, experiences that he had had when he was clear. And so I trust that he was able to take in a piece of that piece, P-E-A-C-E, -E, to take it in a bit, and I hope that it brought him comfort. There's a time for us to be in spiritual, the spiritual discipline of doing. There's a lot to do in this world. There's a lot to do in our families and relationships. There's a lot to do at church. There's a lot to do at our works. There's a lot to do in our extended families and in our other relationships. There's a lot to do in this world to bring about the kind of shalom that God is hungry for on our behalf and who works with us on our behalf. We see the ministry of doing in a couple ways in our scriptures. One is that when three people came and visited Abraham and Sarah, uh, now Abraham did not know them 
but his first response was, what can we do to make you feel at home? And so he was busy getting his work done and making sure that there was a meal and inviting Sarah, or telling Sarah more, more like it in this story, to help prepare. And that's because there was a Jewish um, commandment toward hospitality. Hospitality to the stranger and the alien was among the most important things that a person who was a part of the Jewish community could do. And so that was what Abraham and Sarah did without knowing that at the very end they would find out that they were in fact visited by the presence of God and that they were given a promise, an outlandish promise, because Sarah and Abraham were old. I mean, old, old, like a hundred. I don't know, maybe that's getting less old even to me, but old, old. Sarah was well past the age of bearing a child, and here they got the news that within a year, Sarah would have a son. But the hospitality came before the knowing that there would even be a gift for them, that there would be something in it for them. And then Martha is preparing a meal out of hospitality for Jesus, the rabbi, the teacher. I don't know if she said Messiah at that point to Jesus, but she knew him as her teacher and rabbi. And so she was busy making a meal and scrambling, and she was annoyed at her sister who was not helping, not doing, but merely sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening for what Jesus had to say to her. She felt that that was the most important thing that she could do. And Jesus, when Martha starts complaining, says, but Mary is doing the better part right now. For her, what is most needed is a discipleship of being, to be in the presence of God, to know God. So God also calls us into this discipleship of being. The spiritual discipline or practice of resting, remember that command to Sabbath, of resting our bodies, our minds, our spirits, of our resting so that others can rest, and into that spiritual discipline of being still enough to listen for God, to be still enough to hear who God is and to hear who you are and who we are in relationship to the one who is love, the one who calls for justice. Now, this kind of spiritual practice is foreign to a lot of us. I grew up with the Protestant work ethic, the white, Euro white European Protestant work ethic. And I would guess that many of you did too. You don't even have to be European or Protestant to live in this country where that influence is so strong that we're told that we need to do and produce. We need to be a part of capitalism. We need to be going. We need to be busy. We honor busyness above even what we can produce when we're busy. But always going, always being busy, always focused on the discipleship of doing can lead to some hubris. Because we sometimes work, and I'm guilty of this, as if everything depends on us. As opposed, to, as opposed to depending on God in and through and with us. It can sometimes keep us from honoring the Sabbath rest. Because that doesn't feel very important if we're not doing something. Did it go out again? Thank you for letting me know. So I'll repeat that last, that our discipleship of doing can keep us from both enjoying and in honoring the Sabbath 
rest. And remember, the Sabbath isn't just about us individually, but it's always in the context when it's given in the commandments, in the context of community. You rest so that your laborers can rest, so that your animals can rest and not have to be out in the field. You rest and others can rest. Also, when we don't take time for being, we lose sight of who God is, what God is calling us to, who we are in relationship to God. And so it's this balance always. The discipleship of being and doing. If we tip too far one way, we're missing this call to discipleship, this spiritual practice that helps, helps round us out as people of God. If we tip too far this way, same thing. So we're always called to let those scales be in balance or maybe more it's a tension, right? We might be pulled one way and then we get pulled another way. Ken Samuels, who's a UCC pastor and a writer for our Still Speaking Devotions, um, wrote recently about sheep, about his title was Now I Can Lie Down, and he was talking about this importance of rest and trust. And he, he said something about, I don't know much about sheep because I've never been around them, only what I have to look up every time we have a shepherd uh, reference in, in church. But what, what uh, Patrick, Pastor Samuel says is that in order for sheep to lie down in the pasture, they have to be absolutely convinced that their shepherd is trustworthy and that they are safe, right? Because the shepherd is the one that is keeping watch out for the dangers. And so if a sheep lies down, they are depending fully on the shepherd. It requires a sense of defenselessness. So what would it mean for us to be the sheep that lie down and allow the trust of God, our shepherd, Jesus, our shepherd, to defend us? It requires us to stop defending our egos. It requires us to stop defending the myth that our work, our worth, and our worthiness somehow depends on our busyness and our doing. It would require us from defending our righteousness, that we do enough to earn God's grace. It is a position, a gift, that defenselessness is a gift of allowing us to acknowledge that the only identity that counts for any of us is the name that we get from our God, which is beloved. Beloved child. And we acknowledge that the only safety that can be guaranteed in life is that God will accompany us no matter what we're going through. No matter where our journey leads, no matter what it brings. And Samuels ends with this sentence, and I'll leave you with this. Maybe it's time that we all recognize the inadequacy of our own self-sufficiency and lie down in the green pastures of God's blessed assurance.
men for our beautiful music today. And thank you to Elizabeth, or no, Elizabeth? Yes, Elizabeth for helping out with our music this morning. I want to take just a moment, we're going to start doing this in worship, to talk about our giving. And I want to say that there are, this ministry doesn't just happen. It is sustained by all kinds of gifts that we provide to the church. Gifts of our time, gifts of our talent, and gifts of our treasure. And especially at giving that comes on a regular basis. Our giving this morning was obvious to me on the weekend when I thought about Fern, whose memorial service we just had. She worked here, I think, for 18 years as the office manager, a long time. And she was the one that produced our bulletins and got, made sure our communications went out. She was the one that was kind of the glue to make sure that the rest of the ministries hung together. Fern was here because we contributed to help pay her salary, to make sure that we had enough to pay for someone to be in that position. And then over the weekend, uh, folks on, on SALT were communicating about what would be a fitting uh, tribute to Fern. And so they made a contribution to the American Cancer Society in her name, in her honor, um, for her many years of service to the church. That $100 came from the collective giving that we have done over this year. It's the giving that I do as a part of a church member, knowing that even some of the things that I might not even see that go on behind the scenes that aren't as maybe interesting when you see it happening every day, but it is a part of how we uh, sustain our ministry. And so thank you very much for all of you who are regular givers, for those of you who make donations um, on whatever basis uh, works for you. I want to point out in the bulletin, um, we've, we're offering three ways for you to give. One is if you're in the sanctuary, there is an offering plate at the back, and you can always put a check in there. Um, you can send a check to the office, and the address is here. Uh, or you can bring a check in when, when uh, the office is open in the mornings, Monday through Friday. Or you can give online, and there's a, uh, a web link here for that. But there's also, for those of you who are more techie and like these things, there's a QR code. You can open up your phone's camera and point it at that QR code, and you'll get to the giving link. So um, I give because God has been generous to me, and I want that generous God to be proclaimed, in whatever community I'm at. And so right now, as a part of this community of faith, First Congregational, my offerings of treasure come here. So that together with all of you, I get to help sustain this ministry. So I want to, I will leave it there, but um, we, will, we will have some testimonies in the next few months of why people come to First Congregational Church, what's important to them about it, and why they choose to be giving to it. So listen for that and watch for that as we move along. So let's see what comes next. Our prayers. I'm going to uh, just say one thing about our prayers. I'm not seeing the comments myself on, on YouTube on my phone, but I'm not seeing any comments if they're there. So I'm going to invite those of you who are um, watching live, if you have a prayer request, probably it's best to text me. And my phone number is in the email from the office that came with the YouTube link, so you can find it there. If, if you miss it, um, please feel free to email me, and we'll include it in the Wednesday um, uh, email if we don't get it this, this morning. So thank you.
During the communal prayers music, I would invite you to write out any prayer requests on the cards in the pews. I'll correct, collect them when you are ready. If you're joining us online, as Sonia said, you are welcome to add prayer requests in the chat or text them to Pastor Sonia. Oh, we're not, we're not sending them on the chat, but you're welcome to text them to Pastor Sonia or email them to the office and we'll include those in our Wednesday uh, emails. you into the spirit of prayer. 
knowing that God is already here and listening for us. And as we lift each of these prayers, I invite you to imagine holding them in God's love and God's light. We pray for Carr as they recover from COVID and are grateful that she's doing better. And we hope that we'll see them soon. Prayers for all who are battling cancer, particularly the sister of one who's worshiping with us and those that we love who have been lost to this devastating disease. We hold in God's love and light the families of Virginia Dimmick and Fern Hall, and for all who are grieving their loss, including this congregation. We hold in God's love and light Darlene, whose prayers are to have good health and happiness and find peace with the help of her Savior, Jesus Christ. We hold in God's love and light the beauty and mystery revealed in the images that we have seen this week from the James Webb Telescope. Images that take us into the universe farther and uh, longer than we've ever seen before. And we thank you, God, for your wonderful, amazing, enormous, mysterious creation. We also hold in God's love the ways that creation is growing, groaning because of the ways that we have seen Earth and Earth's creatures and things, rocks and minerals, as resources to exploit rather than as kin. We hold in God's love and light all of those who are experiencing COVID and the new variant, and particularly for the ways that there is unequal distribution of vaccines and other resources around the globe. May we who have so much so plentiful that we can decide whether to get a vaccine or a booster or not, really understand that there are places in the world who don't even have a choice to make. Help us to find ways to enable justice. We hold in God's love and light the war in Ukraine and the many civilian deaths that have happened in the past few days Find a way for peace. Make a way out of no way. We hold in God's love and light all of those who continue to suffer from gun violence. And we lift up particularly the families in Uvalde who this week had to see again a very graphic um, uh, reminder of their loved one's suffering. And we pray and hold in God's love and light those who are hardest hit by inflation and economic uncertainties in these days. May justice prevail. May righteousness flow down like a stream. And God, we ask that you help us to be present in our lives as both doers and beers, <laughs> to be those who see what needs to be done, where justice is waiting too long, where tears are waiting to be comforted, and help us to see where you are inviting us into places of rest, into places of listening, into places of Sabbath, into places of knowing ourselves as beloved, no matter what we are capable of doing, but simply because we exist, we are loved and we have value. 
We ask all of these things in the name of your Son and our Savior and friend, Jesus the Christ. And we ask that you help us to trust that there are prayers that are so deep that we haven't even been able to speak, but already you know them. Already you are holding them in your heart. Already and always you are loving us. Amen. A few announcements today. Uh, summer resource for families of all kinds called Slow Summer is available. It offers many suggestions for slowing down, having fun, and connecting with faith in simple ways. If you missed getting a copy, you can contact the church office. Registration is still open for the Platteville United Methodist Church Vacation Bible School from July 25th to the 29th. 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. for ages pre-K to fifth grade. Free lunch is provided. Pre-registration is required. Contact the Platteville UMC directly. Our weekly schedule of activities can be found in the bulletin or in the Wednesday email. And we'll close with uh, hymn number 448.
and wherever we are in life's journey, we are welcome here. Know that that very blessing goes out the door with you, goes through the uh, web waves to you, whoever you are at any moment, and wherever you are on your life's journey, you already have been welcomed into the arms of God. Be at peace to know that. Be at peace in your doing, and be at peace in your being.